There was once a Catholic CIA agent assigned as a courier of intelligence between Baghdad and Jordan. He would be driven at night in a truck going 145 kilometers an hour without headlights so as to not attract attention. The driver would always be a Muslim and one time the driver asked, is it true? The Catholic responded, is what true? Is it true you Catholics have Jesus? What do you mean? Is it true when you pray you Catholics can make Jesus? Oh, you mean the Eucharist, Holy Communion? Yes, it's true. We have the Christ. The Muslim then asked, then I don't understand. Why are you here? If it's true you have Jesus, if I had Jesus, I would stop everything and spend every hour, every day there with Jesus. So that CIA agent, he went on to become a priest in, the, in Alabama. And that discussion with the Muslim driver, that was part of his journey in switching vocations. So today, as I said before mass, we're celebrating Corpus Christi, body of Christ in Latin. And we Catholics, we believe that Jesus is physically present in our churches. So we're gonna celebrate this today. And what I'm gonna do is, it's gonna be theological, and I'm going to use a lot of the examples and explanations I've used in the past six years. So for those of you who've heard them before, might be a repeat, but I hope you can appreciate them deeper and then even memorize them and use them when you're explaining this to other people. And then for those of you who've never heard these before, you can appreciate them for the first time. The only reason why we believe that Jesus is physically present in the church is because he said so. So we look at the gospel. The bread, Jesus says, the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The people then disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Okay, so Jesus is a teacher and there's a misunderstanding. So a, a good teacher will clarify whenever there's a misunderstanding. Now, Jesus doesn't say that this eating is like a metaphor, like it's a sign of a spiritual and invisible union. He doesn't. Because, uh, and the people know that he's not doing this because whenever Jesus used another metaphor like, I am the vine, you are the branches, notice no one ever questioned him about this one. Why didn't they ever question? Oh, what do you mean? You're not a vine. Why didn't they ever question him about that? Because they knew he's obviously using symbolic language. But this one, there's a dispute because they know there's something, he's meaning something literal. They know he's talking about, okay, his flesh, eating. You're not using a metaphor. And also for Jewish people, um, this metaphor would be a really bad metaphor because in the Old Testament, they were forbidden from drinking the blood of animals or the blood of any other living thing. So this is not going to help. So Jesus, there's a dispute, there's misunderstanding. So he's going to clarify. And what does he do? He doesn't say, you've misunderstood, you've misunderstood me. No, he actually reemphasizes his point. And so he says, very truly I tell you, and remember whenever Jesus says, very truly I tell you, whenever he says, amen, amen, I say to you, uh, that's the sign he's solemnly declaring what he's about to say is true. He says, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in them. In the original Greek of the New Testament, where we translated this from, Jesus actually makes a change of word, words, and we never translate this into English. But what it actually does is, he changes the word eat to chew. He changes the word to gnaw. It's a more physical, a more, um, a less, less prone to misunderstanding. So if we look at the text again, we'll see what he's actually saying. Whoever chews gnaws my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever chews gnaws my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in them. So Jesus, just so that there's no misunderstanding, he's getting more physical so, so that people won't uh, get this wrong. And that is why many disciples left Jesus because of this teaching. They knew this is not a metaphor. He's actually asking for something. 
Now you couple this teaching, this is a famous teaching from John chapter 6, and in every, other, in every Last Supper account, Jesus always says, this is my body, not this is a symbol, this is my body. And the very first Christian witnesses in Christian history, St. Paul, when he writes about what Jesus is saying, St. Paul interprets Jesus literally. So he would say something like this, anyone, St. Paul, anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. So discerning means to recognize. So if we were to take Holy Communion and we don't recognize that as Jesus' body, we, we eat judgment upon ourself. And I have a good evangelical friend, a pastor, so he doesn't agree with our Catholic theology on this, but he himself admits, he says, well, okay, obviously it, it's got to be more than bread, otherwise Paul wouldn't say something like this. So he's not fully, if you will, evangelical in his theology, not fully Catholic, but he, he's recognizing, come on, just look at that. It's got to be more than bread if Paul's saying that. The philosopher Peter Kraft, he writes, look at history. This is the single clearest reason why I became a Catholic, because I looked at history. Not a single Christian in the world for 1,000 years doubted or denied the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. The 11th century heretic Berengar of Tours was the first, and there were no others until the 16th century. So we have this teaching of Jesus, and Catholics have always defined it. We call it the real presence. So how are we going to understand the real presence. So I'm going to break it down into three points. So point number one, what do we mean by real presence? So I'll give you a counter example first. There are some Catholics who have said, if I take communion during this COVID-19 situation, um, because it's the Eucharist, because it's the real presence of Jesus, I, I know he'll protect me. I know I won't get sick. But actually, that's not true, right? The Eucharist can get infected like anything else. That's what we call naive realism. Naive realism. When you look at the Eucharist in too materialistic a way, I, I read a story about a little girl who wouldn't eat ice cream after receiving Holy Communion because she was afraid Jesus would get cold. Now, that's not what Catholics teach. Opposed to this is we always say that Jesus is present in the Eucharist truly, really, and substantially. These three adverbs are used in a technical way, so let's just quickly unpack them. Truly means it's not a symbol. So as if you look at the bread and you have a symbol of Jesus, the bread of life, but he's actually in heaven. We say, no, he's truly there. It means, okay, yes, he, he's, he's there. When we say really, we mean at the level of being. That's a philosophical thing. For those of you who have taken philosophy, we'd say he's ontologically real. So if Jesus is in the tabernacle, and this church is empty, and there's no one here to recognize his presence in the Eucharist, would he still be there? The answer is yes, because his presence doesn't depend on us subjectively acknowledging him. And finally, substantially, it means the reality that's underneath the bread. So we'll get into this. This, this leads to the second point. Second point is, what's actually changing? So when you look at the Eucharist, before Mass, after Mass, after the consecration, like n clearly nothing physically has changed, right? Okay, it looks like bread, tastes like bread, um, smells like bread. So what's changing? So Catholic philosophers, we get this teaching of Jesus who says, my flesh is true food. Okay, so we receive that and we try to understand it. How are we going to make sense? Clearly on a physical change, change, so what's changing? So philosophers have used two terms substance and accident to to explain this so substance comes from the latin word which means to stand under stand underneath and that's the identity what a thing is they use this word accidents which really just means the appearance appearances can change substance will always change stay the same so i, I gave you this example some years ago when i dress up for halloween i always prefer to go as a jedi that's my style get my lightsaber so I changed my appearance, but I'm still Father Justin, of course. But let's say I changed my appearance in a more drastic way. I just put on a ton of weight. I become a Monsignor. Would I be Father Justin? And I'd still be Father Justin. Now let's say the, the physical, the appearance changes even greater. And I get horribly burned, and you can't recognize me anymore. 
And let's say I have amnesia, and I don't even remember who I am. Would I still be Father Justin? And the answer is yes. So the substance is always remaining the same, but there are drastic changes in the appearance, in the accidents. So we're used to, in reality, we see appearances changing all the time while the subject stays intact. But God, in some kind of miraculous way, he can do the opposite. He can keep the appearance intact, and he can shift the subject, the substance, the identity. So that's why we have the theological term now, transubstantiation. Literally means across the substance, because we believe the substance is changing, but none of the appearance, none of the physical properties are changing. When the priest consecrates bread and wine during Mass, um, like I said, still looks, has all the physical properties of bread and wine, but the subject is now changed, and that's why we treat the Eucharist with this extreme love, because we love Jesus. And even if there's the tiniest fragment or crumb in your hand when you receive the Eucharist, that's Jesus. So we have to be extremely careful and consume those crumbs. And now the third point. Well, how would a change like this happen? How would you explain that? So Bishop Robert Barron in L.A. gives this wonderful example. He says um, it's by words affecting reality. So he, he uses these parallel examples. He says, in our human experience, sometimes a word can affect our inner reality. So if someone affirms us and says, I believe in you, that, those words can affect our inner reality, self-perception for life. Let's say someone criticizes us. That can d damage us for our whole life, affect the way we look at ourselves. Now, let's say there's a, a, a stronger level. Let's say you have a properly deputized police officer, and he says, you're under arrest. Your reality would be changed at a juridical level. Now, if Father Justin, if I said to all of you, you're under arrest, nothing would happen. I don't have that kind of authority. And now there's, then he gives a third level. So imagine if God's words could actually change the substance. And then you have a, a properly ordained priest endowed with spiritual authority. And whenever he repeats Jesus' words at Mass, he can change the substance, the reality of a thing, only in this specific case. So words affect reality. In 1950, the Catholic author, Flannery O'Connor, she was invited to dinner. And the host of the dinner was a fallen away Catholic. And during the conversation, the host said, the Eucharist, it's a very good symbol. And Flannery responded, she said, um, if it's, well, if it's only a symbol, to hell with it. <laughs> Not a very diplomatic response. What was she getting at? It was her Catholic sensibility thinking, what? If it's just a symbol, why would we go to all this trouble to kneel before it, protect it, all this energy and time to show it, uh, to venerate it, to teach our kids about it? One of our uh, parishioners, one of our sisters here, Natalie Ng, uh, she's going to go last week to the protest downtown to stand up, uh, to, stand, uh, to fight against racism. Very good. But she didn't go because of COVID-19. But she's coming to Mass still. She's chosen to take that risk to come to Mass. Why? Because Jesus is really present here. So today is this great celebration. Jesus loves us so much. He's giving us his physical presence. And you know, in the past three months, since the pandemic started, March 11th, uh, we've all come to appreciate the difference between real and virtual presence, right? So Zoom is great, Skype is good, and we, we love that, we need it. But it's a big difference between that and being physically present with someone. I said on Holy Thursday, April 9th, spiritual communion for all of you at home right now, that is the way you will receive grace. You're, you will receive as much grace as you desire, and that's your spiritual communion. But one thing I didn't mention in that homily on April 9th was, Spiritual communion always has to lead to physical communion. So it's kind of like the person, when we're, if we're doing Zoom, we can't say, well, I'm, I'm going to stay here forever doing all Zoom conferences. No, eventually we want to be together. You have to have that desire. So while you can receive so many graces right now at home, and praise God for that, that he, he comes to us when we're at home and we can't receive Jesus physically, we, our desire should be, I can't wait to get back. 
because Jesus knew 2,000 years ago we need the physical presence, and that's why he gave us the Eucharist. During the lockdown, I heard someone say, I would kill for the Eucharist. <laughs> well, obviously a joke, but we know what he's getting at. We want, we have to hunger for the Eucharist. I got criticized by another priest when I gave that story about when my dad died. So the morning I found out my dad died, I celebrated Mass before I went to home to see my mom. And I said to you during the homily, just take away everything else and just give me the Mass. Ultimately, that's, that's the thing I need the most. And the other priest said to me, um, You've gone too, you're, you're going too far. I don't think so. What I said, that sentiment... I think is in line with the teaching, the teachings and the examples of the saints. In 1997, St. Paul's Church in Richmond, my home church, we started our Perpetual Adoration Chapel led by Father Peter Chang. And he just died this past uh, May 23rd. And that Adoration Chapel was a big part of my life. Um, I would always go there like after tennis, uh, after hanging out with friends, just want to be with Jesus. And it's a big part of me uh, discerning and finally having the grace to become a priest. And when I was in my fourth year of studies, I wrote Father Peter a letter and I said, Father, would you know of anyone at the parish who would help pay for my final semester? Because I just felt in my heart that it was my choice to follow God to become a priest and I didn't want my family to have to pay for me. So I said, Father, would you know anyone who could help me? Father Peter wrote me uh, back and he said, here's a check for over $2,000, and it was from him. He chose to pay for it. And he said, don't tell anyone about this. And I've never told anyone about this until now. I'm finally happy that I can share it now that he's passed away. And Father Peter's generosity in starting the Perpetual Adoration Chapel and his generosity in helping a seminarian pay for his tuition that came from his big Eucharistic heart, that Eucharistic heart that loved Jesus so much. So every church Father Peter got assigned to, he'd always want to honor the Eucharist. You know, he goes to St. Stephen's in North Van, buy a new tabernacle, always trying to love the Eucharist and always trying to love everyone. And when he would come here for Mass at St. Anthony's, a lot of you would remember, he'd after, right after communion, he'd start singing this song, Thank You, Thank You, Jesus. Very simple, very childlike, but ex expressed a very pure faith and a very profound faith in Jesus. I've asked uh, the choir today, could you sing that song? Uh, after Mass, so that we can express our simple, pure gratitude to Jesus. Father Peter's spiritual legacy is that he helped someone become a priest, and he helped hundreds, probably thousands of people to have a Eucharistic heart. So I have a question for all of you today. When you die, will anyone have a Eucharistic heart because of you? So will your kids, your spouse, your family, your friends, who will say, because of you, I have a Eucharistic heart. Someone told me recently, it's a great, it's a, it's a great uh, grace, it's an affirmation. She said, uh, I now understand the importance and the power of the Eucharist thanks to my ministry. Praise God. That CIA agent's life was changed when the Muslim driver said, if I had Jesus, I would stop everything and spend every hour, every day there with Jesus. And our lives, too, have changed because other people have helped us understand that Jesus has given us his real presence. <laughs>